Hey everybody, it's me ATS and welcome back again to the channel. So I'm going to back up a little bit today. I want to be a little bit more spaced out. I talk a lot of my hands if you guys don't know me. Whoa, that one bright. So I talk a lot of my hands for those who do know me very well. Um, <laughs> and I can be a little silly and dramatic, so I'd like you guys to see that. Just to see how I move and express more than just being right up close here for you guys. Like, oh, hey, Aaron. How you doing? What's up? Just like bug eyed. Oh, God. <laughs> I can't back up too fast, I think, because this camera doesn't like it. I am going to invest in a better one come January at some point. Hopefully. Um, but for now... Let's get into today's video, shall we? So today's video, I actually wanted to talk a lot about, one moment here. Minimize that so you can kind of see what's going on. So today's video, I wanted to talk a lot about some mental health and that again, like I had mentioned in the past video that literally just happened recently. <laughs> Who would have known, right? Aaron is actually getting on track with actually doing some content. Trust me, I'm surprised too. Don't don't feel bad. I'm surprised. So today's topic is actually going to be part of a series. So I want to start a series on depression, anxiety, mental health in general. So I want to, well, mental health illness, mental illness, mental health. There's a difference. Mental health is just your mental state. But mental illness is something that's going on with your mental state, such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, and different things like that. So I want to start a sort of series on the best way I can explain using a verified source, not just my own opinion words, but using a source um, the source I'm using in today's video is Canadian Mental Health Association's source for mental health. So today I want to talk on depression. And we're going to go through, well, I'm going to go through the Canadian Mental Health Association's sort of description on depression, what you can do to help someone with depression, um, like as a loved one and how to kind of be a partner to them in that situation. So without further ado, I'll get on to kind of what the Canadian Mental Health Association kind of describes depression as. So describe depression as being a mental illness that affects a person's mood, the way a person feels. Mood impacts the way people think about themselves, related to others, and interact with the world around them. This is more than a bad day or feeling blue. And they're actually very right. Um, because they actually go on to mention that without support like treatments, depression can last for a long time. And some for people, they have long span periods of depression. Um, and depression can come in different sort of signs, it's different sort of outlying features. Everyone's depression shows himself in a little bit of a different way than we might actually assume. It's not just sometimes it's not just a person being sad. It can actually be a person even beating themselves up. Um, so signs of depression, as they say here on the Canadian Mental Health Association's website, include feeling sad, worthless, hopeless, guilty, or anxious a lot of the time. And those feelings actually don't just come one and the same. Sometimes you get mixtures of them. So someone might feel anxious or worthless. At the same time so sort of a situation myself had I've had with depression in the past is feeling my own worth and my friends own worth of me with their own impression of my worth um, even though these have been people that stayed by me for years um, or I feel close to or I have worked with um, I often feel sometimes that I didn't appear very liked at all. And it, to me, it went beyond the feeling of just them um, not remotely 
preferring me and being more like they actually had a disdain towards me. Um, but not an open disdain, like a sort of background. And as I find something that happens in uh, depression a lot, you get thoughts in the back of your mind. Things that kind of pick at you. It's like when you're going to bed and you get that thought in the back of your head about something you did that day. Say at work, let's say you work as a server. At work you spilt a drink on someone's table. And in the back of your head, right as you're about to fall asleep, you get that sort of voice saying, that customer thinks you're an idiot. Or your boss now has another reason to fire you. Or you shouldn't be a server if you can't even properly hold a drink. And that's kind of like sort of some of the things that depression and anxiety do. Depression kind of also kicks up a notch as well with some people, if left untreated especially. Um, or without support. Depression often hits randomly. There doesn't even have to be a reason for depression. When you can actually wake up some days and just not feel 100% or yourself. And that's something that's hard for people with depression is figure out who they are and what is their natural state. And that's why some people take medication to balance that out. To kind of feel that they're themselves. Some people, medication is not typically the route they like to take because they probably don't feel comfortable with pills or they just have bad experiences with them. Um, for everyone's different reasons and different supports are varied for depression. And it, like I said, it comes in multiple forms of shapes, sizes, and severities, um, but all forms should be taken seriously. So continue on with them. Um, what they also say some signs are depression is some people feel irritated, sorry, irritable or angry. People lose interest in things they used to enjoy and may withdraw from others. So that's actually a lot more common, I find, than just the sad, worthless, hopeless, guilty, or anxious. I find more people typically lose interest in things. And a good example of that is actually me with this YouTube channel. So for a while, I had... I had enjoyed this, it was something I like, but I felt myself losing interest. So many different very things, I just didn't feel like I could go forward. And I did withdraw from others as well. I've had friends, I still have friends who are scared that I'm going to disappear on them sometimes. And that in itself can also feed into depression too, even if they're replacing concern. So, losing interest in things. It's a big thing to keep that sign open. If you know a friend who say was really into hockey, like they've been the biggest hockey fan you've ever known for a long time, and suddenly they're not wanting to watch their team play, or they're getting rid of old knickknacks they had from that team, or they're just not really interested in talking about it. That usually gives me a sign that something's up with them. It might be depression. Um, usually a good thing to do is reach out to them in that situation, I find. And we'll get into later how to be a good support as well, um, rather than just leaving you guys to it. Um, so, like I said, people withdraw from others as well. And that's, I find, a really, really common one. You kind of shut yourself in. Um, I often notice with myself even that I, despite having friends and having been in a dormitory in university, when I moved off campus and my depression kind of hit up to a new high, I kind of made myself disconnect from them and even friends that I had outside of university. And yeah, I just, you get sort of closed off. You feel like you've put yourself into a box and that you don't have the key for it but you are the one with the key but you're also kind of scared to open that box because you're scared of what might be out there for you and that's how you find where the anxiousness comes in too because you're worried about how people might view you now for being depressed for not being okay and that's one big thing i want to do with the series as well is let people know it's okay to not be okay i'm a big supporter of mental health my whole degree is on 
My whole degree's purpose is to work with mental health eventually. So, <laughs> moving on. <clears throat> The pressure can make it hard to focus on tasks and remember information. It can be hard to concentrate and learn new things or make decisions. So when you have a friend and you've noticed or they have informed you that they have depression and you're asking them to do things with you, go out and make plans, and suddenly they can't decide whether or not to say yes to you or if they want to cancel or they want to keep going. So sometimes that friend you have that can't seem to make up their mind on, on doing something, that's not always just being indecisive. Sometimes that is a sign that they're just having a hard time right now. And I find that is a very true sign, depression. And like I said, I'll make a lot of associations with the things that they say on the, on the Canadian Mental Health Association with myself if they are applicable. Because also, I do not have every mental illness on the book. Um, and I try, and I'm in a good place with mine at the moment. I believe so. I, I like to think so. I do see counseling. so And I do recommend counseling for anyone else who feels like they might be having hard times. Or just to keep up with your regular mental health. Um, so, yeah, back on to sort of the losing focus on tasks and that. Sometimes... Your friends that are going through depression kind of zone out and not necessarily right away in that moment, but kind of later on and things sort of dissipate away. And if you had, say, a friend who was really good in their studies, but suddenly their grades are taking a drop because they're just not being able to retain this new information that they're trying to learn while going to school because it's kind of hard for someone to manage their depression and go to school at the same time because often or not, in a lot of cases, I find that people who are in school and going through depression, they'll associate with some of their triggers for depression with school. And that's not to say that people with depression can't go to school. That's just more to so to say that with school comes stress and with stress, depression I find can be a little bit more susceptible. Like I said, I am not an expert 100% on any sort of mental illness at the time. I am only taking school at the moment. I am in my bachelor's. And this is just sort of opinions mixed in with a government website that, well, a charity government sort of association website that deals with the topic. So I am just kind of using what they provide me and kind of trying to keep away from my own full-on opinions as well. So depression can change the way people eat, sleep. Many people experience physical health problems. And so this is where I find people with depression end up seeing most of their association with people and their mental illness getting talked about. So when they're around people or family, that's when they start talking about it because they'll start saying, oh, you look tired or you look pale or sickly or what's another word to use? <laughs> so many words. Um, or you end up going to need to go to hospital because your stomach's hurting, your chest is hurting, you got major headaches. Dep your own mood, like depression, even though it's a mood disorder, um, it can affect your physical health as well. Have you ever stressed out so much you gave yourself a headache? That's kind of what depression does in some ways, but almost with almost anything in your body, with your body, with your body, it kind of varies and molds to the person. <clears throat> so age and sex can also impact how persons experience depression. Males often experience anger or irritability rather than sadness, which can make depression harder for others to see. Young people and older adults may experience lasting changes in mood that are mistakably dismissed as normal part of growing up or aging. So when you hear a lot of people talking about, well, well depression is more common now today than it was when I was a kid. Um... Why are so many people depressed now than they weren't before? Well, that's the thing, is many people went undiagnosed with depression and other mental illnesses. Because back then, to have things like that, 
was shameful. It was something to feel bad about. But now that is not the case. Now we're, well, we're working on breaking down the stereotypes that surround mental health and mental illness. That it's okay to talk about your mental illness and okay to care about your mental health. So it's a more about the nurture yourself so you can be better. Not just happier and more positive and things like that, but to have a better experience overall. We have one life, as we know, and it's. I find it's a really good thing to talk about these things and work on them so you can enjoy and make the most of the life we have been given or we want to work through. Now, I want to move on to the who did it affect? So depression is, and you're also, I'm going to quote here again, like I have in a couple things. So I skipped over one of the topics and this I'll come back to in another one, uh, which was bipolar disorder. Okay, so depression and bipolar disorder can affect anyone. They are likely caused by many different factors that work together, including family, history, biology, the environment, life experiences, personality, physical health problems. Essentially, this is a big way of saying no matter who you are, no matter where you are from, no matter the things you might have experienced in that, it is possible for that individual to have depression. So when you see someone who's doing well, it's not right to acknowledge, sorry, <laughs> not acknowledge, it is not right to write off their emotions and their mood and their feelings and what is wrong with them, what is going on with them. So just because a person outwardly appears to have everything, money, a car, a house, a degree, a beautiful wife, boyfriend, or children, even if they have good health, it's not right to say that they can't be depressed that they can't have depression and it's not right to make them feel like that's not okay just because they might have a little more than someone else because everyone's susceptible with it and everyone has the right to feel a certain way and we really can't write that off on anyone so regardless of who it is or what they do or where they're from Remember, anyone can be going through anything that we ourselves do not know because we are not them. So keep that in mind when thinking about if someone's depressed or if they tell you they're depressed. One, word, one phrase I will say in my own personal experience, never use with a person going through any form of mental illness, especially depression I found, is why are you depressed? You have no reason to be depressed. Because at that moment, I find you write yourself off as someone that person feels they can trust and confide in. And if you feel like this person is important to you and you want them to be able to talk to you, don't say things like that. Because that leads, in my own personal experience, that leads you not to want to talk to them, not want to tell them what's wrong. You kind of just want to bottle it up, hide it away, and throw it in the river and hope no one finds it. Okay, so some treatment options I that come up with uh, depression actually, obviously, are counseling and support. That's uh, one. Usually, you compare you pair this with medication in a lot of cases for a, a good amount of people. So, a type of counseling called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT is common for mood disorders. It teaches you how your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors work together. It also teaches important skills like solving problems, managing stress, realistic thinking, and relaxation. CBT is often the first treatment to try experiencing mild or moderate problems with depression. So that's one of the forms of counseling, a type of counseling there that is used. So this is to help people sort of understand where their depression might be coming from, how their mood and their body and everything sort of works together. And that's a really good form of treatment I find and that one I found was one of the better ones for me helping me understand myself so I could work on myself so I could kind of find a better sort of 
way of working past my problems. And I know other people who have also felt that was a good way for them. Support groups are also very important. Depression and bipolar disorder can isolate people from others and isolation can add to mood problems. Support groups are a safe place to share your experiences, learn from others, and connect with people who understand that you're going through. So support groups can vary into just a small group of friends that you trust with all of your heart and soul and all your being to a support group you go to counseling with. Other people who are experiencing this, which understand, kind of understand the situation that you're going through. Both options are not bad, I find. I haven't been in the sort of end with friends around me. I have been into the ones where multiple people around me have had it. And we've kind of talked out, shared our experiences. And it was also a way for us to reassure each other that we're okay. Not being okay. And that we can do our best to try and get through it. And I think that's a big thing, is trying to look on the side of optimism when you're depressed. It's not always easy either, but having someone reassure you that what you are feeling isn't wrong or bad, that it's natural and it's not that you're broken is really important. It's, it makes you feel like you belong. It makes you feel less like a broken porcelain doll and more like a sturdy standing tree because you feel more grounded. You feel more rooted when you feel those reassurances flooding into you. Now, medication is also very common, um, but taking care of your well-being is especially important if you're working through recovery, but this can be easy to overlook. Regular exercise can boost your mood and help you manage stress, eating well, and learning to maintain healthy sleeping habits are also very helpful. It's always important to spend time on activities you enjoy, find relaxation strategies that work for you, and spend time with loved ones. So relaxation strategies, they're not all technically relaxing. <laughs> um, so one strategy I learned to cope with anger, irritability, with depression was actually to tighten up every single muscle in my body until I was literally shaking. That includes the face too, it's like this. Then you hold it and you let it go. <laughs> because you see it takes off extra energy. It kind of takes away some of that energy that might have gone into either anger, irritability, or sadness and other forms of that might have of emotion that might have stemmed from your depression. Um, there are there is sort of a grounding exercises too when your depression kind of messes with your head, like the senses one. Um, but I believe it goes. If I'm wrong, off the top of my head, if I'm wrong, please correct me and feel free to laugh at me. <laughs> so I believe it goes five things you can see. Four things you can, I believe it's, yeah. Five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. I believe I got that right. So doing that with your eyes closed kind of, well, not your eyes closed at first, honestly kind of grounds you, kind of puts you back in the moment. It takes away from those overwhelming moments where depression and anxiety might run rampant. Um, so moving past that, we'll go into medication real quick. I won't stay too long in this topic because it's pretty, pretty regular sort of understanding of what medication is. So antidepressants are the main kind of medication used to treat depression. There are many different classes and types of antidepressants, they each work a little differently. However, antidepressants may not be the best option for bipolar disorder. Instead, bipolar disorder may be treated with mood stabilizers while medications can help with some symptoms. They can't get rid of the thinking patterns or beliefs that can drive mood problems. Most people use a combination of medication and counseling. Like I said in the beginning there of that section was a combination usually is what ends up occurring. Counseling though I find is the biggest supporter more than even medication 
and that will vary for people. But for myself, I found counseling was the biggest support for me over medication. Um, have I taken medication? Yes, I have. Um, but as for what I found helped me for my personal self was counseling. And that will vary for other people. So just because it helped me doesn't mean it's the best one for you. So find the best treatment that works for you in that case. Okay, so I want to move down to finish off the rest of this video with uh, how can I help a loved one? And now this is what I really like about Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, they're really good about putting out the resources there. And actually after this, I'm probably going to get in contact with them to get some more information beyond just this for videos like this because I really want to do more videos like this for this sort of series. When can someone you love, I'm oh, sorry, when someone you love is diagnosed with depression or bipolar disorder, you may wonder how you can really help. You can offer support in different ways. You can offer emotional support, practical support to help make their journey less daunting. You can also help a loved one watch for signs of relapse or other difficulties, which is an important part of maintaining wellness. So people who, so I'm still quoting here, by the way, people who experience an episode of depression may have thoughts of ending their life. This is a sign that a loved one needs extra support. If you believe that a loved one is in danger, don't hesitate to call 911 or your local crisis line. So here in New Brunswick, it's Chimo. That is a really good crisis line. The people on the line are really good, especially around this time of, the coronavirus going in and causing lockdown when that was at its rampant high point back in March and April heading into June when there wasn't some when things were more uncertain than they are now which they are still very uncertain and it's still a very serious thing that we're still working to get past and hopefully we can get through it as a community now one thing I do want to say in the when it comes to when someone needs extra support with depression, when you see signs of suicide, the key thing I find in that situation, especially is in my own personal experience, don't make a person when you have someone who's suffering with thoughts of suicide is a big help to just be there listen you don't even need to talk but to listen and I mean really listen hear what they're saying don't run it through a filter and then process it how it reflects on yourself because remember what this person experiences doesn't necessarily have anything to do with something involving you. And I find that's a big thing that a lot of people typically do when it comes to talking or trying to support someone with suicidal thoughts and depression is they sort it through themselves. They often, sometimes I feel people feel that, oh, so me caring for you isn't good enough is one of the ones I've heard before. And don't make a person feel selfish for having these thoughts and these fears because that's just going to hurt them more. But moving past that, we're going to go into these tips that the Canadian Mental, Self <laughs> Canadian Mental Health Association gives you for helping support a loved one. Learn more about the illness. Listen to your loved one so you have a better understanding of their experiences. That helps you understand what they're going through, the things they're trying to get across, and sometimes they might not get across clearly. Someone who experiences an episode of depression may want to spend time alone or act out in frustration, and this can hurt other people's feelings. These are just symptoms. It isn't about you. And that's a key thing. Try to remember what's going on isn't about you, and they might not necessarily mean the things they do or say. So... It's one of the best and really good step here is to try to have some understanding. Um, it's going to hurt, and it's understandable. We do feel bad about it. They do feel bad about it. Just try and still be supportive regardless of that fact. Ask your loved one how you can help. 
think about practical help um, with day-to-day -day tasks too. So try, try to figure out ways to help them manage, not just the depression. Sometimes helping someone adjust to cleaning their room more regularly helps them. I find cleaning your room or the space you spend the most time in is a good way to boost your motivation and your feelings. I find I'm most happy in a clean space. <laughs> I don't always keep it clean though. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not as good at keeping it as clean as I would like to. I do my best. It's not bad though, I promise you. Um, but having a clean space, I find it makes a clean mind. And this applies for work and home, I find. Um, but I really do find having a clean space helps you feel a little bit more level. Um, make sure your expectations are realistic. Recovery, take, recovery takes time and effort. It means a lot when you recognize your loved one work towards wellness regardless of the outcomes. Making your own boundaries. Here's another point. Make your own boundaries and talk about behavior you aren't willing to deal with. So when you're helping someone, you do need to set boundaries. And one of the perfect sayings I really enjoy, which comes from a man by the name of Ben, that was, I'm not gonna say his last name because I don't have his permission here to, but Ben was a really cool guy who I kind of looked up to. And he said something to me one time when helping me out, was you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't help someone if you don't help yourself. And that stuck with me. That, that stuck with me. And I preach it to my friends. I think to the point where they want to uh, shove an empty cup down my throat. <laughs> um, but no, you cannot pour from an empty cup. So you can't give something you do not have. So take care of yourself. Set your boundaries. Make sure that you're taking care of you. Make sure you're letting them know, the people you're trying to help, that, okay, hitting me. I'm not going to tolerate you hitting me. I'm not going to tolerate getting yelled at. I will tolerate this, this, and this, and this, but I will not tolerate this. I will be here for you. I care for you. I love you. And that's another thing too. Express when you're setting your boundaries that this isn't about me not wanting to help you. This is about make me also making sure I'm okay so I can help you be okay. Seek support for yourself and think about joining a support group for loved ones. If family members are affected by loved one's illness, consider family counseling. So this one's one I might not really have as much of a understanding of because I don't go through this one myself. But it does make a lot of sense in my sort of books here. Um, so seek support for yourself is one I can. Like I said, you can't help others if you don't help yourself. Um, so a support group for loved ones. Um, so what this is kind of referring to is either I think it's a personal support group or reach out to a society or charity near you that deals with uh, mental illness. And they might have sort of things like that in set where you and others going through similar situations can talk and sort of understand the different variety of situations going on and kind of express your own, let things out, um, just so you don't hold things in yourself. And consider family counseling. I've not gone through family counseling myself. Um, I have no personal experience with it, um, but the concept behind it is essentially that you guys all sit down together. You kind of talk things out, you try and be as honest as possible, and it's about kind of conveying the feelings you're not sure how to convey without a professional and support to help clarify the things being said so things don't get misunderstood in translation that being said so like you don't want someone you love that you brought in saying like you don't want them to feel like oh this this person is a nuisance i don't get why i have to deal with them but you also don't want the you don't want the one your loved one to be like uh oh my depression is caused because of them they're the sole reason and it's their fault. You don't want to be like that either. Um, you don't want that. You don't want your loved one to think that's what you're saying. So you don't want each other to get confused on what you're trying to say because sometimes these things aren't as easy to explain. If I could explain every moment I've ever been depressed down to the T, 
I think I think I wouldn't be dealing with them. I find that's a big thing we need to understand about mental illness. It's hard to identify sometimes why you're depressed. Sometimes there isn't a reason. And it's okay for there not to be. So this right here was this one here was the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, down below, I am going to leave the link to the Canadian Mental Health Association's website. This way, we can. This way, I can kind of allow people to go to the source I looked up, kind of check out other things on their website, and you can read for yourself the things I went through in this video. So, if you or someone you know is suffering with depression, just know things can and will get better. It's okay not to be okay. And I think the sooner we all be okay with that, the better. Because we're human. And at the end of the day, we just want to feel like we belong and that we have a place. I thank you guys for watching. And I hope you look forward to more videos on different mental illnesses, different things like eating disorders, and kind of what they entail, how you can be a supporter, what they are, and what to kind of expect. And like I said, for these videos, I will make sure to pull up relevant sources and link them in the videos down below. This way you guys can become more educated as well. I think it's important to get the words out there, to break down the stereotypes, and to bring an age where people don't look at depression less than someone, well, look at mental illness less than someone breaking their arm. That a person who is suffering with severe depression isn't told, oh, the person over there broke his arm. He has something to be sad about. We're a world where we can all realize it's okay not to be okay. I'm ATS, and thank you guys for watching. I'm tuning in for the next video. If you like this, make sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more. And if you have topics or certain different types of mental illnesses or mental health um, scenarios and things you want me to talk about in a series, Leave a comment down below with some suggestions and I'll see what I can do. Until then, thank you guys for watching and remember, it's okay not to be okay. I'll see you guys next time. Yeah.